Good afternoon, this is Schweitzer, and this is our recent look into the investigation of an atom. We'll be looking at properties of atoms, properties of electrons, what devices are available to allow us to investigate that atom further. Um, one of the main names of this thing is called um, molecular spectroscopy. I'm not too worried about the names, although you will see some names here that are more important than others. Basically, this is the idea of using electromagnetic radiation to investigate something at the molecular level. Um, one type of locator is called electronic spectroscopy. Now, to me, this is more probably called a flame test. Electronic just meaning electrons. We'll take an item and we'll give it energy and, we, uh, and watch electrons bounce from what we call a ground state. bounce up to an excited state and then when they fall back down they give off a photon of light. Now a photon of light is going to be an identifier energy wise of that particular movement of, the, of that electron therefore possibly the atom itself. Better picture right here. Um, using a moderate amount of energy to move electrons up and down um, energy levels. Visible light and UV light can achieve this. For example it's theorized that copper 2 plus are uh, copper ions um, inside solutions and they produce this blue color and that blue is theorized to be being achieved that when light hits it electrons are moving they drop back down and give off this particular light um, Bunsen burner can often achieve, achieve this as well so we'll take um, a substance and put it into a moderate amount of energy with a Bunsen burner and we can cause this shift to occur um, when we cause an electron to move energy levels, for example, we get a very specific, what we call emission spectra, emission spectra. Now, this isn't necessarily going to be involved with uh, just a Bunsen burner, but for example, if I take a hydrogen atom and I have three energy levels here, let's just say, uh, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. An electron really has a couple options. It can jump all the way to the top and fall all the way down. It can jump just to the second one and come down, or maybe it could drop from the third one down to the second. So when you look at the spectrum, you'd see that there'd be, um, so basically we hit it with energy and then we look. And using uh, devices, we can say, okay, well, also here's a spectrum of light right here at this energy level. And then all of a sudden we get another one right here at this energy level and another one up here at this energy level. These three spikes are characteristic of the three different movements of electrons. Highest energy would probably be from three dropping down to one. This might be from three dropping down to two. This might be from one uh, well from two dropping down to one. So these are characteristic movements of electrons and, and every atom has some sort of emission spectra um, kind of like a flame test, but at a more complicated level. I identify the atoms. So as we produce light, chemistry ventures into a area of light, and they try to look at and describe light a little bit. So a couple things you may want to know is all light travels the same speed. The speed of light is 3.0 e to the eighth meters per second. So as light travels along, it can vibrate up and down, and it can do this quickly, uh, slowly, or and I'll just increase the frequency up and down like so. If you're going up and down slowly, then you would have a large wavelength. If you go fast, you'd have a small wavelength. Wavelength is from one point on a wave to the next point on the wave. You can't have um, a high frequency up and down rate and have a long wavelength. Since they're all traveling the same speed, it's one or the other. This formula locks these together. Lambda, which I usually write like this, I'm not sure who's backwards here, um, is the wavelength. And this is the Greek letter uh, nu, probably a better way written right there. Looks like a V. Sometimes in physics we just write F for frequency. And uh, this is the frequency. Sloppily written, sorry about that. Lambda wavelength measured usually in distance of meters. 
This would be usually one a cycle or wavelength per second. Those are our units. Um, an example of this particular thing might be if we have 101.1 FM radio station in my area. That's a popular uh, teen maybe uh, radio station. And this is a FM megahertz. And if you wanted to figure out what's the wavelength of that substance. Well, speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. And solve for wavelength. Speed of light divided by the frequency equals the wavelength. Plug these values in. 3.0 e to the eighth meters per second divided by uh, 101.1. Now that's a mega. means a million. e to the sixth one over seconds. Hertz. And things per second. Um, that is the same as hertz. Divide it out and you get something pretty close to 3 meters. I don't have my calculator on me, so that's the close we're going to get. Application of that particular formula. Here's another formula. Energy of a wave. Energy uh, is going to be equal to the Planck's constant, H. 6.626 um, e to the negative, I think it's about 38 or th something like that, some small number. Uh, Planck's constant is joules times seconds. You can look that number on your laminated sheet. Um, if you really want it, times the frequency, which is 1 over seconds, gives me a unit in, uh, of energy in joules. All right. Notice that here, that if we increase the frequency, that we increase the energy. So as I go on my wave, I have a different version of this picture here. I had the same one on the last slide. Um, we have a large wavelength, um, which is correlating with a very small frequency. Small wavelength, high frequency. This is the area of high energy. I'm not going to go through an example of doing this formula. You can plug in Planck's constant, plug in the frequency, you know, 101.1 e to the sixth, and then you can solve for the energy in joules. Very small amount of energy. Results of flame test. What do we want to use a flame test for? Well, we could use it to identify a substance. Cool picture there. Um, vibrational spectroscopy. If we use a lower energy wave, just um, then we don't maybe have enough energy to simply move the electrons. We might just be able to adjust or move the atoms. So imagine tapping a bell. A bell will vibrate at a very specific frequency regardless of how hard you tap it. So you can tap it and you can stand back and listen. This is an example of an IR spectroscopy. We're simply going to hit it with some energy, like tapping a bell, sit back and listen to what comes off. Molecules can vibrate and spin, and these motions will give back energy much like a bell gives back its ringing sound. Okay. Now, IR spectroscopy is more likely to vibrate it. Now, you could take, for example, if you had a, a molecule uh, with a new electrons are on the outside, protons in the middle, I have a bonding to another atom with a positive protons and then electrons on the outside. Again, as I breathe these things closer and closer together, the protons are getting closer together, so they're going to be repelling. But then, of course, the protons are attracted to the electrons here, so there's some attraction. So there's a constant give and take, bouncing back and forth of this thing. As you hit it, it just causes this sort of spring between these things to vibrate back and forth, back and forth. And of course, that gives off a byproduct of some amount of disturbance. And that disturbance is what we are picking up. Um, different, atom, different combinations of atoms connecting will vibrate very specifically. So the nature of how these atoms vibrate can, can identify the type of atom on a molecule. Functional groups are, can be identified, specific separates it from the flame test. So we can actually tell something about a molecule. Here's an example of results from an IR spectrum. So if we have to take benzyl aldehyde, uh, in this case we can see that it has individual pieces. They're getting spikes from this guy um, that might describe the individual pieces. On an actual note, what I would probably do is if I'm looking at a, an aldehyde, I might put in a known substance, which I know what it is, look for the spikes and then put the unknown in and then check for correlating spikes. Um, so IR is does this. If you go even lower, microwaves, uh, then really a, a microwave can not eat, doesn't have really much energy to get to vibrate back and forth. It normally just takes a molecule and spins it. 
Um, this is the principle on which a microwave works. That spinning creates friction, which creates thermal energy and heats things. All right. Um, a mass spectrometer. How does mass spectrometer work? Well, just a bit of content knowledge that you may not have. If you take any sort of charged particle and you send it through a magnetic field, and as long as the charged particles are moving, or if you could alternate the magnetic field, you will have a force applied on that particle. So we'll have a deviation of this. So we take a charged particle and you deviate it through this particular magnetic field. Based on its mass, it will, because of object in motion, tends to stay in motion until it's acted on an equal opposite force. So uh, the heavier particles will act differently than the lighter particles. You can actually separate them out by mass. And this is a mass to charge ratio. And because every particle goes through it, we actually can figure out a relative abundance of these particles. Relative, not total amount, but proportionally different amounts. This gives us mass, a mass ratio that, that let's say, um, IR does not. It also can tell us the individual pieces that might be there. That's also very good as well. Results for mass spec. Individual identifying pieces that might be present um, and their ratios. All right, this is a little bit different, but again, it uses light and we use it to assess something at the atomic level. We have Beer's Law, light absorption and concentration. As you send light through a substance, that light can get absorbed. Um, so, how much light gets absorbed? Well, it depends on the substance that's in there. Each substance has its own absorptivity constant. Um, has a length, how far it's going to go, obviously matters. And then how many are there matters is concentration. So this particular formula right here is um, often seen, but very rarely used. More often than not, we would use a Beer's Law plot. Use some known samples of known concentrations and check the constant, how much light goes through it and create a Beer's Law plot. This is now a very good tool that we use to test an unknown substance for absorbance and find the correlating concentration. Very, very important lab technique. All right, um, photoelectron spectroscopy. Why use a PES? This gives us more information relative to electron structure around the atom. Um, this is a very good tool for relating a bunch of stuff involving what we know about electrons. Um, the periodic trends. Um, ionization energy. Okay, there is a separate video just on this topic, so I'm not going to spend any time on this particular topic. Um, but it is becoming more and more common on the AP exam uh, as of 2015. All right, and that is it. Thank you very much.